symposium a good opportunity to reflect on ASEAN's potential and learn from prominent academics and the practitioners from the prestigious research institutions and the academia from the 10 participating countries. A glance through the list of presentations and discussion topics for today and tomorrow reveals the amazing diversity and the insights from the participants' practices and theoretical reflections. A symposia like this provide a valuable opportunity for researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to share experiences uh, <coughs> which has generally lacked in Asian uh, development studies community. I believe uh, this is one of the significant contributions we could make uh, as a community. I am grateful to all the participants who have come to share their knowledge and experiences. I am sure you will have uh, fruitful and uh, rewarding exchanges uh, today and tomorrow uh, not only in the formal event, uh, formal event like this, but also through diverse uh, networking opportunities. Uh, I wish you find the value uh, from this uh, uh, symposium, and definitely you will. And I look forward uh, to learning from all of us. Uh, before I close, uh, I'd like to thank again the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for hosting the symposium and those involved in preparation of the event for their efforts, uh, Dr. Kim sung -kyu, Dr. Park ji and and uh, uh, Ms. Lee Hyo-ju, Jeon ji Kang Kang Min-jung on our side, and uh, Ms. Roana Taliping uh, on the Philippine side, uh, to name only a few. Uh, lastly, I'd like to express our special thanks to Rutriji uh, for the Rutriji Best Paper Award. Uh, which I hope will help lead to a tangible outcome uh, of the symposium, uh, not only from this year's symposium, but also from the uh, previous ones. Uh, I will uh, tell again later, but please make a contribution to the edited book we are planning to make, uh, publish it, uh, from your valuable research. Uh, I said at the beginning that uh, it is a real achievement to have held four symposia like this in a row. I hope this tradition continues uh, let's do our best uh, for the sustainability of this forum and our community. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Now may we hear uh, a short or a brief message from our former president, Dr. Gilberto Llanto. By the way, uh, our partnership with Kydex started during his term. Sir? Thank you. It comes as a surprise that I am called to speak a little because I'm not in the program. I think they feel guilty in not calling me to the podium because uh, <laughs> I retired on February of this year, but I was retained as member of the Board of Trustees. Having said that, I would like to just, uh, of course, welcome you on behalf of uh, the President and the whole Institute to this uh, conference, uh, this forum that will tackle development cooperation in ASEAN. I think it's a very timely topic. And I was reading through the papers, at least for the first uh, session, the first five papers, and immediately I could sense that uh, we are in for a very good discussion of issues that really uh, touch our lives. Uh, there would be papers on security and I was looking in particular at uh, papers on uh, the role of foreign aid in the ASEAN. Now, development cooperation is, is I think, a very critical issue, especially because uh, we are witness to what has happened in the global economy. One country, or uh, let, let, let me put it this way. I should be politically correct sometimes. <laughs> the spillover, you know, coming from uh, the demise of the uh, mortgage markets in, in the U.S. You, you know the story, the background. Spillover is, okay, it has some uh, negative spillover effects to countries around the globe. The impact of the financial crisis was not confined to the, just the U.S. alone, but it spilled over to the rest of the world because of the interconnectedness, the connectivity, interconnectedness of economies around the globe, even small developing countries like the Philippines felt the, the impact. 
and immediately the what I could sense is that immediately the world uh, uh, econ the different economies around the globe, the leaders tried to spring into action to you know first calm the markets, calm the financial markets, and uh, try to sustain the liberal order that has really been a factor in the growth trajectories of many countries. Now what I saw there is an attempt to cooperate, maybe even imperfectly, cooperate with each other in coming out with certain policies. So you would see central banks around the globe talk of quantitative easing and, different and, and, and use different instruments precisely to bear down on the crisis. Now, the global financial crisis has a lingering effect on many economies, including the ASEAN, including the rest of East Asia. But nonetheless, there's hope that, uh, you know, in the horizon, people are saying, what will be the next crisis? Will it be a pandemic? Will, will, will a pandemic uh, uh, trigger the next crisis? Will it be the uh, uh, large-scale informal lending in, in, in some countries in, in East Asia? Will it be an uh, issue in the South China Sea? What, 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 what will trigger the next crisis? Now, nobody can, of course, uh, forecast exactly what will be the next uh, crisis. But what we can say is that unless we sit down and really try to know each other better, try to cooperate more deeply, try to see that we share a common humanity in the first place, uh, unless we do that, then uh, it will be very difficult for us to, you know, uh, parlay or... Uh, develop measures to address the next crisis, whatever it will take. So I, I really like this kind of forum. When we talk of development cooperation, uh, at the personal level, this will be an occasion for us to know, to have new friends and, uh, you know, to get acquainted. We read each other's works, but we haven't connected the face to the literature. Maybe this is the time for us to connect the face to the literature we're reading. And also the time to get a sense of uh, how other nations feel about, you know, very deep um, issues affecting our countries. Uh, foreign aid, and I come back to that because I used to be deputy minister and the minister of economic planning, and, and I was in charge of reviewing international uh, projects, especially those funded by official development assistance. So this, this foreign aid, issue of donors, technical assistance, grants, are issues very near to my heart. Having seen close and how the cooperation between Philippines, for example, and uh, bilateral partner, South Korea or US or uh, whatever, Japan, how this bilateral cooperation has cut deeply into policies in the Philippines, which became the uh, uh, basis for future growth. Uh, I just end with just one note. I remember, I recall, long time ago, I was sitting with across a the table with my Japanese counterparts. And to, to cut the long story short, they were saying, uh, Sir Lianto, you know for, for a fact that you know, most of the infrastructure in, in the Philippines has been funded by Japanese ODA. Why don't we just put a little flag of Japan <laughs> beneath the bridge, you know, <laughs> so that people would know that this is you know, something coming from, from the uh, good heart of the Japanese taxpayer. Well, my memory is uh, foggy. I'm now si to be 68 years old. Yeah, <laughs> I will be 68 on Saturday of this of this month. So it's my birthday <laughs> this year. <laughs> 68. So my memory is foggy. I stutter. I commit mistakes. But I can recall what I said in that meeting. I said, "Well, let's put it this way. Let's put there the respective flags of our countries, or the flags of." Yeah, Philippine flag and Japanese, side by side, to show that we cooperated in building this particular uh, structure, a, a road or a bridge. And uh, we came to that agreement. Because the thing that drove me to say that is that it's not a unilateral effort, you know, from the goodness of the heart of the Japanese taxpayers, but it's also because uh, the, the gain is mutual. The gain is mutual. It's not only the Filipino people that's gained from the infrastructure funded by Japanese ODA, but it's also Japanese taxpayers gaining from that kind of cooperation 
in a country like the Philippines. And I, I would include that. I, I'm a discussant, so you will uh, <laughs> hear that, that point said again and again. But I am not the speaker. I'm just somebody who was just called upon instantaneously. You know? <laughs> I don't have a prepared speech, as you can see. I'm here to just put you, you know, in, in, in uh, to really to welcome you and say that, well, let's hope this to be a very frank, honest assessment, exchange, and let's uh, do away with the formalities. I purposely did not wear a necktie because I, I really want to say uh, I will be among friends and new friends today. So welcome. Um, I can speak for another thir 20 minutes if you want because our president is arriving at 9.30. <laughs> but <laughs> since time of the, is of the essence and we need to buckle down to work, thank you. Welcome. And there's somebody here who will read the message of the president? Hmm? Later on? This is quaint, huh? The, the welcome remarks come at the end. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for that wonderful extemporaneous speech, sir, and advance happy birthday, by the way. Um, the president will have a message when she arrives, but uh, before we continue with the, the, with the session, may we request everyone for a photo opportunity, please? Ms. G and Gwen, assist. So uh, we'll have to arrange you there at the back because the back the backdrop is there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we'd like to inform uh, go to the link fb.com slash peats.ph so you can also inform your friends in Korea and anywhere in the world that you are being live, live streamed now. Okay, so now we start with session two, it's rather session one. I'm advanced. <laughs> okay, so um, let me introduce to you the chair for the first session titled Non-ASEAN Actors for ASEAN um, Development. He, he is a former Deputy Director General at the Foreign Service Institute of the Philippines. He was a Fulbright graduate scholar at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and an Asia Studies Visiting Fellow at the East-West Center in Washington, D.C. He has also published peer-reviewed journal, uh, journal articles, book chapters, and commentaries in online news media. He is currently the convener of the Regional Security Architecture Program of the Asia Pathways to Progress. He also teaches international relations, international security, 
international organizations, and international law in various schools and universities in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Julio Amador III. Thank you and good morning. Uh, let me just first thank Akaidek and the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for inviting me. I'll just do the initial introductions from this uh, podium and then resume my chairing at my chair. No? Uh, uh, normally, uh, we the, the Forest Service Institute, when I was there as Deputy Director General, had very good ties with the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Uh, anything involving numbers, we leave to PIDS. Anything involving words, we took it at FSI. So we had a good uh, complementary activity and uh, in distracto activities. Now, since 2008, the discussion in ASEAN has always been about ASEAN centrality, how ASEAN guides the development of the regional security architecture as well as the regional economic architecture. In the past three, four years, however, we have seen various initiatives coming from ASEAN's dialogue partners. Of course, the most prominent and most well known is the Belt and Road Initiative of China, but we also have initiatives from the United States. Uh, Japan has always been a critical ASEAN partner, and recently, Korea enunciated its new southern policy. All of this uh, provides, uh, creates challenges for ASEAN on how to respond particularly because ASEAN initiatives such as the Initiative for ASEAN Integration and the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity have not really taken uh, off no. uh, precisely because of the institutional challenges inherent in an intergovernmental association such as ASEAN. This is why it's, uh, the papers for today's session are actually quite interesting because they provide uh, dialogue partners uh, perspective on how their countries are contributing or even challenging the development discussions within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So let me just introduce my panel briefly because you have their profile in the program. Our first presenter would be Dr. Yun Mei Lim, who shall be presenting a paper on gender equality to ASEAN countries. The second presenter is Dr. Yukiko Nishikawa of Nagoya. University, who will be giving a perspective on Japanese ODA for ASEAN. Then we have Dr. Meibu Wang of Shanghai University, who will give uh, her views on the Belt and Road Initiative and Chinese foreign aid. And then we will have Dr. Sania Nordavletova from Kazakhstan, who shall discuss the ASEAN Regional Forum. And the last presenter would be Dr. Jin Yong Lee of Kyung Hee University, who will discuss for us the new southern policy of South Korea. Now the discussants, we have Dr. Gilbert Llanto, of course, of PIDS. Um, we also have Dr. Bim Prasad Shestra of Nepal, Kathmandu University, and Dr. Jiyun Park of Chonbuk National University, and Dr. Yun Shik Jang of Seoul National University. So may I now give the floor to Dr. Yun Mei Lim for her presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, how many minutes do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Then 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, the, uh, the paper has been distributed, so probably uh, you can have more information on, about my presentation. So I'll try to uh, uh, meet the given time, try to uh, in 15 minutes. Okay. So my topic is uh, about uh, the aid allocation, especially uh, by Korea and Japan, comparative studies of Korea and Japan uh, to the Asian uh, countries, particularly I focused on, out of 10 Asian countries, I focused on eight uh, Asian, uh, ASEAN, I'm sorry, ASEAN countries cause who, are, who have been the major recipient of uh, particularly Japan and Korea's uh, uh, gender equality aid. So, uh, how do I, 
Okay. So before I get into um, this one, how I got uh, uh, it, uh, got into this topic because, uh, uh, especially since the MDGs and also the SDG Japan uh, and Korea have very strongly committed to promote gender equality, and in in fact. Uh, Japan and Korea have increased their uh, total volume of aid to or for the gender equality and uh, very impressively. Uh, so uh, so I uh, was wondering how this massive increase in gender equality aid actually have impact on the, uh, the gender, so-called gender impact uh, on the uh, recipient countries. So uh, what I, um, also the national, uh, let's say Japanese and Koreans national ODA policy framework and guidelines and all kinds of initiatives also emphasize that gender must be mainstreamed in the aid allocations. So I wanted to find out whether this is the case. Okay, uh, by analyzing the particularly these eight uh, selected uh, uh, ASEAN countries. So uh, Japan, for example, as you can see in the uh, screen, uh, gender equality aid volume increased 100 uh, more than 100% increase. It's a massive increase uh, over the uh, last uh, seven years, six, uh, seven years, because I, I selected this year because in 2010, Korea became a member of DAC. So I selected this particular years because it's a time that Korea also increased, emphasized gender equality increase that. So now Japan, uh, currently uh, Japan is the second largest gender equality aid donors after the EU. So as an individual donor country, Japan is the largest gender equality donor. And Korea, although the, uh, the volume is uh, very limited, I mean, a, a lot less than uh, and Japan, you know, Japanese aid, however, also Korea also increased the, the under the title of uh, uh, gender equality aid, increased by 200, close to 260%. This is a massive thing. And when we know that DACA average during the same period, only 66% increase. Okay, so uh, I select these particular countries, uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, Philippines, Vietnam, because uh, these are the major recipient, not only the overall aid uh, from Korea and Japan, but also the aid for the gender equalities. And then I use the data uh, from the uh, OECD DOC credit reporting system. They provide all the information about the gender equality aid. So uh, it especially, I, I use the data, which is the, the provided by OECD DOC using called the gender equality policy marker, which specify the, uh, how much money was being distributed, allocated to these countries. So uh, the issue right now in the field of uh, 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 the development cooperation also, uh, uh, especially in the context of gender equality, is the mainstreaming, uh, gender mainstream in aid allocations. It's much talk and much emphasized, but uh, my, I, my question was whether this is the case. Okay, so um, next one. So I just wanted to show briefly, so ODA aid, this is overall uh, the, uh, the dark members. You can see that gender uh, equality aid has been very, increased a lot, but quite interestingly, this is uh, due to mainly Japanese contribution and also some Korean. And then uh, later I'll explain, but you can see the different colors. Can I, do I have a pointer? Yes. You can see the, the color, the, the green, the blue and red color, but uh, it has a significant meaning. So I'm just going to talk a lot about this. And then my, uh, one of my goals of this paper is to raise the issues about using this uh, measurement or indicators to uh, specify the gender uh, equality aid. So my ultimate goal eventually, if I, this is a very preliminary study, see yeah, I just uh, studied, and then I hope to raise the uh, question or the challenge, the dark, I always dark measurement of gender equality aid. So, oh uh, boy, this is uh, small, but so the DAC every year uh, publish this information data about the gender equality aid uh, using called uh, gender equality policy marker. So I don't know, so, so small, but you can see the, uh, the donor country list and then Japan by volume is the largest after the EU. And then uh, by looking at two uh, category, principal category and significant category, probably some of you, most of you know, but if you're not, let me briefly explain. Principal aid is, uh, is provide or uh, distribute to the, to target uh, specifically a woman or uh, empowerment of women. That means the, 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 they allocate this aid 
from the, the designing period, they target the women so that they, this be, uh, aid benefit the women directly. However, significant, under the significant marker, this one is aid uh, uh, is marked as gender equality aid. However, women will be uh, uh, benef uh, beneficiary indirectly. Okay, so now docs, uh, uh, according to their uh, explanations, the, the significant marker or principal marker, significant marker is also important because uh, you don't have to really target only women, but once you target other group, also will benefit indirectly uh, the uh, women. Therefore, the significant marker also uh, indicates the gender mainstreaming. Gender is a cross-cutting issue, so you uh, attribute, I mean, uh, attri okay, dispute all the aid, other whole sector, therefore eventually, combination of principal aid and significant aid will be the one that helped to promote gender equality in the recipient country. That's the uh, starting point and uh, my goal of this, I criticize that, I, I severely criticize it. Okay, so let me go before go. Like here, the color, you can see that, the blue color is a secondary objective. Sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Sorry, <coughs> it's cold. Mm -hmm. Get more water. <laughs> I got something in there. It's so exciting. I'm so <coughs> something in my throat. So red color is the, the, the primary uh, target. So you can see that so-called whole bunch of the money under the name of aid for gender equality, majority are given. Okay, through the, this uh, uh, significant purpose. Okay, so that's. Now, for example, this is uh, data I, I collected from the CRS sources. Japanese aid allocation for gender equality. You can see that the pink color is a, a primary pro uh, objective. So Japanese aid is pretty much uh, given under the, the, this category of called significant objectives, an indirect objective for gender equality. And then over the 10 years, come, uh, whole years, the, the major recipient, top recipient, of course you can see the India, but because uh, it's a massive amount, it's by volume. <coughs> Pretty much those um, eight ASEAN countries are the always top 10 recipient. Korean case, <coughs> you can see that the, we have more pink, we have more pink people than uh, Japan. Looks like this. The pink color is more principal purpose, more targeting the women directly. Women become the direct with uh, the beneficiaries. However, the amount is very, very small compared to that. Also, those uh, uh, eight ASEAN countries that I indicated in my studies, also the major top, always top uh, uh, recipient. So. This is quite interesting. You can see, so I only look at the, the significant first objective first, which is aid is a given with the name of gender mainstreaming. In the, so we say we justify that we are mainstream gender anyway. So all women eventually will be beneficiary. But this is Japanese aid, which is the largest amount going in over the last 10 years. Now you can see that this amount is massive. Okay, okay, sorry. I don't want to point your eyes, but here. So you have uh, six uh, countries like that. And then uh, again, the massive amount was given to uh, the Philippines. Philippines was the largest recipient of uh, gender aid, equality aid. We have many Filipinos here. Did you know that? You have massive aid from Japan for gender equalities, like the blue colors, the, the bars. And then 2016, it was uh, Vietnam. We have people from Vietnam. No? Yes, I'm going to move. But again, before that, the, the years, other years, very small portion, right? Compared to the different years, you can see the certain years, massive money was going into certain countries with the secondary objective, gender equality aid. So it's a principle-wise, the amount is a whole lot smaller, but you can see the more equal in the among uh, uh, countries. Korean case, again, is a significant secondary objective, but we do have also have a similar trends in 2014. In this case, the Vietnam uh, green color, which country was it? I cannot see that. Ah, 
is a Vietnam. So Vietnam and also the Myanmar was the largest, but again, uh, the bar is tall, bar, but actually the amount is just tiny, okay? And then, uh, the ob it, this is quite interesting too, but principal objective, direct impact on women, Korea give a whole lot of uh, money, I mean proportionally, compared to Japan. So Korea's aid is more targeting, I can, okay, uh, maybe uh, carefully mention, argue that Korea's aid toward the gender equality is more uh, through the uh, principal subjective, proportionally. But uh, look at the uh, 2000, the blue color is the Philippines. Philippines also received a lot of aid for targeting directly women of gender equalities from Korea. Now, another interesting thing is, I just want to show all the tape. So I got a uh, sort of interesting finding on, okay, do they give aid uh, through, uh, through a, a grant or through loan? Because often Japanese aid has been known by many scholars that they uh, may focus on the economic uh, infrastructures. Oh? Okay, economic infrastructures. And so often these uh, gender equality issues, uh, something is uh, remote from this uh, more economic, national, commercial interest. Maybe the, the, the gender equality should be more based on developmental or other okay, purpose. Whether this is the case, this was my question. So when I look at the, uh, my, I, I'm not looking at my own data here. Uh, when I look at this data, actually I compare the two countries. This is uh, the, 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 Total amount over the ten, uh, the seven years. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it. The Japanese case, Cambodian case. So quite interesting is, pre uh, overall. Ja can I uh, show the uh, here? For example, for the total Japan case, you can see that the total amount is a million units. is a million, and um, oh, you cannot see it. The, the screen doesn't show at the, the bottom. There. Uh, the current what uh, only uh, six uh, less than seven percent of their total aid for gender equality was through grant. Ninety three point one percent was through uh, loan, concessional loan, and then for gender equality. For Korean case, uh, the grant was ninety nine percent. So Korea's aid for the gender equality allocation of gender equity was through 99% through grant. This totally opposite. For Japanese, 93% uh, through loans. And then, and then, and then after the even more interesting thing is, but when you look at the number of projects, because amount is a huge for Japan, Korea small, but what about the, well, how much money they spent per project? So per project, quite interesting is, even though J Japan has so much money, much more money than Korea. Number of projects in the same period, Korea has more project. That means what? Korea's project is per project, we have a tiny money per project, even though it's grant. And so, uh, the quite interestingly, if it's a grant, if the Japan use a grant for gender equality, then okay, it's 97% of the grant was mostly targeting directly principles, principal purpose. But for Korea, grant, again, uh, we have a high, uh, much uh, uh, le less than the Japanese case in terms of loan, but still Korea spend more uh, grant for gender equality. But most of project is done with a tiny small money per project. This is the, the I found. So, uh, so, this is, okay, so I wanted to look at the sector because this is about also gender mainstream issues, I argue. Uh, this is the data provided by uh, uh, the DOC, uh, CRS data, and then it's a five digit, okay, sector code. But looking at the uh, Japanese aid under the, or targeting gender equality is predominantly goes to the, the infrastructure, economic infrastructure, particularly the transport and storage. And then there are tiny money uh, with a grant, tiny money and other small portion of loans goes to uh, basic health and education and others. Where you can see the little in center. Massively go to, that's what they call Japanese keep, and then the doc report every year. That's why Japanese number two 
gender aid donors right now, according to this data. Okay. And so now Korea, is, is, this is a Korea. Korea's money is a lot smaller, but Korea's again is, is also in line with the Korea's general overall uh, aid uh, uh, policy, which concentrate in edu basic education and health, and Korea's also give, this is a Korea, it's so quite different from Japan. And so lastly, my question, so whether uh, my goal, my, my, uh, this paper is not really uh, the targeting, the uh, estimating the impact of the uh, this aid on uh, the women, because that's my further research. Maybe need to do more uh, uh, the, uh, the quantity analysis, but I'll do that later. But for today, so I just uh, look at the, some uh, simple correlations between GII means Gender Inequality Index by UNDP. Okay, this is uh, overall uh, the very well uh, spent. I, I mean, used uh, Gender Inequality Index. Japanese case, it doesn't matter whether this recipient country is uh, very high gender equality or not. Actually, the, the better, uh, in terms of gender equality, receive more gender equality aid under this category of significant objective. So like this, uh, Philippines and Vietnam is the, the actually better in terms of gender inequality. Better. So they have more gender equal society, but the amount is massive more than others. For Korea, somewhat similar, but different. Korean case, uh, Vietnam also received large amount. However, uh, like for example, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia received more. So this, so uh, my conclusion, I'll do study more, okay? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but here again, so I don't think it's really they consider this uh, really the you know the gender equality inequality issues when they when they marked as a gender equality aid. So. I challenge the doc. Anybody here from doc? Okay, this. I think this one is a very contested uh, measure. Okay, I argue because uh, in the name of uh, gender mainstream principles, they they include the so-called secondary objective of gender allocation uh, and aid allocation. They justify, but when uh, when we look at the uh, one sector is only heavily concentrated, and they was not really uh, correlate with the gender equality inequality in society. Can we really call this aid is really for the gender equality for the uh, recipient countries? So now uh, I challenge the, uh, the Japanese, also the Koreans, is whether the Japan should be or could be the uh, number two countries give uh, gender aid. That's my okay. My I I'll take some questions later. I have I can go on for another hour, but okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of studies are showing that investment in women and uh, female are going to produce a lot of dividends for any country. And I think this is a good starting point for discussions later. Let me just acknowledge the presence of the president of the PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Uh, we will have her remarks later. Uh, <laughs> now, um, just to remind our speakers, each of you have 20 minutes and 15 minutes for the discussions, and we shall have a working break I think at the discretion of the chair, so I will be discreet about it, okay? So <laughs> I may now have Dr. Yukiko Nishikawa uh, for the next presentation. Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before I start, on behalf of Japan Society for International Development, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Korean Association of International Development and Cooperation and also Philippine Institute for, Inter uh, for Development Studies for giving us this great opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, my topic, Japan's role for ASEAN development, um, my argument is very straightforward. Um, first, um, there are continuous uh, cooperation between Japan and ASEAN country, which, is, uh, which has been so. So um, the continuous element is Japan and ASEAN's strong tie. The second point is uh, Japan is going to introduce new area uh, in, in terms of Japan-ASEAN cooperation, which is more political and defense area. So let me start, um, first of all, 
uh, the continuous element. Um, well, for ASEAN, Japan is the third largest trading partner. And for Japan, ASEAN is the second largest trading partner. So to, well, Japan and ASEAN has been very, very close relation uh, over the last uh, 50 years. And this relation will continue for next, well, mid-term, short-term uh, period. And if we look at Japan's ODA, well, its peak was in the 1990s, and now the amount is declining. However, the distribution of ODA to Southeast Asian country or overall Asian region is the largest uh, always in its history. Although after 2000, Japan's ODA distribution diversified to Africa, Middle East, and other part of the world. However, it maintains large portion um, of distribution to Asia. So this trend will, will not change uh, for next couple of decades, and uh, ASEAN continue to be very important uh, Japan's partner. But in my paper, I pointed out that um, some, some scholar pointed out Japan's growth is, is termed as Japanese model or Japan model. But uh, for me, it is imprecise to, to express in that way. This is largely because Japan could not achieve its economic growth alone. Japan needed trading partner, and also Japan needed countries that provide raw materials, because Japan is a resource little country. So in that sense, um, Japan restored its relation with ASEAN country in the post-World War period, which was very important, not only f economically, but also politically. Without restoring the relation, uh, it was difficult for Japan to be integrated into Asia and also the globe. So it was very important for Japan to, before achieving its growth, to restore relation with ASEAN countries, particularly Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia. So this model, if people call it Japan model, um, I think it's uh, half right but half wrong. I would call it, it Asian model because Japan needed partner at that time and also Japan contribute to, to resource development in Southeast Asian countries and also infrastructure development. So I call it Asian model. And in the next generation, I believe this Asian model will be much more strengthened, partly because um, ASEAN countries now achieving its growth and their growth, and Japan continue to support. And I identify in my papers there are two areas that Japan especially um, contribute for development in ASEAN country. First is infrastructural development. This is largely because Japan's ODA has been focusing on infrastructural development. And ASEAN, is, ASEAN countries are now um, trying to establish ASEAN community and the integration of ASEAN is considered as an important uh, trigger for further growth. So this is why um, Japan will particularly strengthen its ties through infrastructure development. And fortunately, Japan and China is competing for this area. So in, in a sense, for ASEAN countries, it's a great opportunity for them. They have more bargaining power to gain better opportunities. And the second area that Japan would um, cooperate in, in the region is um, disaster management. Um, Japan has been suffering from different disaster, earthquake, tsunami, and so as in Southeast Asia. So in this region, Japan have com comparative advantage um, to work with uh, ASEAN countries. These are the areas that Japan will continue to support ASEAN and uh, will mutually develop 
with each other. But the, in the new area that I would like to emphasize in this presentation is that, well, after Prime Minister Shinzo Abe took his third term, uh, he refocused cooperation with ASEAN countries. This is largely because Japan's economy is stagnated and uh, the current um, policy is that it would like to revitalize its industry, particularly through industrial uh, infrastructure development in ASEAN countries. So Prime Minister Abe refocused cooperation with ASEAN countries. But at the same time, uh, in the political and defense field, Prime Minister Abe focused on cooperation with Southeast Asian countries. Well, this is partly because Japan and uh, China um, and also Japan and uh, some other countries <laughs> continue to struggle to maintain security in the Asia Pacific region. And of course, US and Japan continue to have a strong tie. And also, Japan is looking at uh, the situation in South China Sea. So, well, in academic conference, it is often avoided to address this issue. But uh, if I look at Japan's ODA, recent years, ODA is very much securitized. It is used to cooperate defense areas. Well, Japan contributed to providing um, ships and, uh, well, arms nowadays to Philippines and also other Southeast Asian countries. So surprisingly, um, Japan's ODA is, well, it's not allowed to use for military purposes, but it is allowed to use for international cooperation and international development area. So by the name of international cooperation, it contributes political and defense area uh, in, in, in cooperation with Southeast Asian countries. But if I closely look at Prime Minister Abe's policy, uh, it's not simply supporting uh, Southeast Asian countries to counter China, but I believe uh, Japan's cooperation with Southeast Asian countries in the area of defense is that Japan would like to maintain the liberal order in the region. This is largely because without liberal order, it was difficult for Japan to achieve its economic growth vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN countries. So um, not only physically uh, maintain peace, but also Japan's effort is to maintain the liberal order in, in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nishi Nishikawa, for the short and sweet presentation. Uh, we'll have Dr. Mabo Wang, uh, the third presenter, please. Good morning, everyone. So you, I have the PPT. Is, oh, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mm, my name is Mabel Huang. Uh, before, I work in Xiamen University, Economic School of Xiamen University. But this year, I moved to Shanghai to, uh, to a university. The name is Shanghai University of International Business and Economics. Very long name. And uh, uh, as I think in, in the international uh, development uh, uh, community, we all know that China this year, we established a new Deven international development cooperation agency in, in April. So just after that, we uh, in our university, we established the International Development Cooperation Academy, which uh, doing the research 
in inter, uh, in inter, uh, Chinese folding aid and the development financing and uh, uh, outward uh, FDI. My topic is about the Belt Road Initiative and Chinese folding aid. Uh, Belt Road and the Road Initiative was uh, 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 was brought out in 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 twenty uh, thirteen in the September and the October of twenty thirteen. Uh, the meaning of uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, is like, uh, for my understanding, is that one is that uh, is uh, is. I think this is a uh, Chinese uh, involvement in globalization uh, uh, goes to the second stage. Before Chinese, uh, uh, chi China inv be involved in globalization, uh, more is in international trade uh, perspective, but now it uh, goes to the international investment uh, stage. And and also the international investment is uh, uh, FDI is outward at Y. And the, <coughs> the second is that uh, Chinese uh, market uh, and the cooperation uh, with outward uh, before it was mostly uh, developed countries, U U United States, European country, and the J Japanese, uh, Japan. So, but now we more balanced to developing countries. Uh, one belt and one road uh, countries mostly are developing countries. But the One Belt and One Road initiative is not a, a, a economic cooperation framework. Uh, fr framework is, it has no framework. It's just a, a kind of a policy uh, direction uh, which push the bilateral and the multilateral cooperation with the other countries. And these countries mostly in Asia, in, in, uh, in Europe, in Middle East, and uh, 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 from from this year's uh, uh, China Africa uh, Cooperation Forum, we can see uh, the the topic of this year's uh, this year's China Africa Co uh, Cooperation Forum is uh, the the most important topic is the relationship of these African countries with One Belt and One Road Initiative. So uh, so all these countries, mostly the Belt Road countries, are developing countries. So uh, that means Chinese relationship, uh, China relationship with these countries, uh, one important part is folding aid. So this is what uh, I want to discuss about the how uh, Chinese folding aid uh, will be shaped by the One Belt and the One Road Initiative. So. Uh, uh, th this paper is not is just a, a draft, so is uh, I think I have uh, we just think about that uh, in, in a big in a big map, uh, not uh, so so many detail. We need to be improved. So I will discuss this in three parts. First is how Chi Chinese folding aid to match uh, 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 how China folding aid have been matched to uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and second is the challenges, and the, and the third is how Chinese folding aid should be reformed to match this Belt and Road Initiative. Maybe I, I read that. So the first, uh, uh, the f uh, first of all, so uh, I will discuss about Chinese uh, because uh, uh, it's already five years from 2013. So uh, how about Chinese foreign aid uh, have been done to in order to match this uh, Belt and Road Initiative? First, uh, there are several uh, characteristics. First is the uh, aid scale. Uh, uh, after the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was uh, uh, was announced in the international uh, community. Then uh, the MOFCOM and uh, uh, even the President Xi Jinping, uh, uh, President Xi Jinping has uh, pro promised full commitment in the in the 20, 2017 Belt and Road International Forum. Uh, what China, uh, what Chinese foreign aid will be uh, will be distributed in in the Belt and Road. Uh, 
uh, countries. And the MOFCOM also published the measures for falling aid management in 2014 to uh, point out that the falling aid work will be coordinated with the Built and Road Initiative and the, surround and the other related strategies. <coughs> and uh, some new aid funds will be mainly uh, uh, distributed towards the countries along the Belt Road uh, countries. Uh, but here is a problem, yeah, what is the Belt Road? Uh, uh, how many countries are Belt Road countries? Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, people will say the, uh, from the two, two uh, from the map, we can, uh, we can count about uh, uh, 64 to 65 countries are built road uh, countries, and the later uh, uh, African countries also join, and then uh, more and more recently, uh, like Latin Americas, Latin American countries also be, uh, could be a part of a built road initiative. That means the whole <laughs> international, uh, all the countries could be. Uh, could be Belt Road country, and uh, any country who want to uh, uh, who who want to uh, to develop the uh, economic cooperation with China, then that country is Belt Road uh, uh, Belt Road countries. So uh, this is uh, one, uh, the first uh, the first point is the aid scale, and then the second. is uh, eight sectors. Uh, as we know, uh, for uh, just, just now, uh, our Japanese scholars mentioned the East Asia model, which pay more attention to the infrastructure and the economic uh, sectors. I think, um, of course, the internationally, uh, for dark countries, they emphasize more social, social sectors. <laughs> but uh, the uh, e economic sector and also infrastructure is what the East, this East Asia countries, China, Korea, uh, Japan, this is what their uh, comparative advantage. They, and, and, and this is the field they can contribute to the international, uh, international world. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, for Belt and Road Initiative, it has uh, five, five, um, uh, five contents. So one is uh, policy, con uh, policy negotiation. The second is the infrastructure connect connectivity, and the, then the trade investment promotion. And the the the, the fifth is uh, financial uh, financial supporting, and finally is the people to people cooperation. So the the most imp uh, the most important and also the beginning point is the infrastructure infrastructure uh, connection. So uh, for the falling aid to, to this field, also the infrastructure uh, construction is uh, uh, still very important. Of course, China also need to, uh, uh, the people to people con connection and the uh, policy negotiation also very important. So, so uh, of course, Chinese foreign also need to pay attention to the social sectors. Uh, for the eight participants, uh, which uh, because the the government uh, government money to government uh, f uh, funding to the falling aid is quite limited, so so uh, involve those uh, private sectors and also the uh, private sector and, and NGO is quite important in uh, in the falling aid. So uh, uh, China tries to to. Uh, to do this, to push this, to push the private sectors to be involved in this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So, so uh, the, uh, such as the PPP and uh, such as some special fund is very important, uh, special like the Sil Silk Road uh, Fund and other. There are many of this kind kind of fund fund was uh, in what, uh, innovated. Now and uh, they are all trying to to join the uh, build the road the construction uh, construction plan. And uh, uh, then is the uh, aid uh, modality aid modality. So uh, 
uh, the government concession loan is very important for Chinese foreign aid. It, it is about 60% uh, of Chinese foreign aid. So th this is still the very important characteristics of Chinese, uh, Chinese funding for, uh, for aid and also the bilateral assistance uh, it, uh, is uh, uh, still plays a very important role. Of course, now China uh, turned its uh, uh, attitude to more positive to this uh, triangular cooperation uh, in foreign aid. And uh, finally, is uh, pro uh, Chinese foreign aid is still uh, the important, uh, the most important is the project assistance. Uh, this is what uh, Chinese foreign aid uh, is doing um, until now in uh, Belt Road Initiative. Uh, and uh, for the uh, for the region and the country the uh, distribution of Chinese foreign aid, uh, Chinese foreign aid uh, uh, different from Japanese foreign aid. Uh, Chinese foreign aid uh, about 50, 57 percent of Chinese foreign aid is uh, is given to the African countries. African, but uh, uh, after the Build the Road Initiative, the uh, the government uh, the government official in in the Chinese International Development Corporation agency, they said uh, maybe more uh, Chinese funds will be go, will um, be distributed to the Asia countries. Yeah. Uh, uh, from the, um, uh, as I mentioned just now, the, 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 the most important and the, uh, the beginning point of the Belt Road Initiative is the infrastructure connectivity. So, uh, 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 for example, for the railroad, uh, railroad building and uh, and uh, uh, railway railway and uh, pipe uh, oil and the gas pipe and uh, some ports build uh, construction so all these all these uh, um, uh, projects all these pro projects uh, are um, uh, uh, are in different places of the 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 uh, Different places of the of the world, so not uh, just uh, African country is just uh, one part of that. So so and because uh, Asia country is uh, just uh, uh, neighbor neighbor countries. So uh, so Chinese foreign aid to uh, and uh, and the infrastructure connect uh, construction uh, infrastructure construction will be put uh, put more on the uh, Asia countries. So uh, the second part of my uh, of my presentation is the challenge of Chinese foreign aid to to how Chinese foreign aid can be matched to the Belt and the Road Initiative. On um, uh, firstly, that there is a big gap between the uh, the foreign aid. Uh, uh, supply and the demand, yeah. Uh, not just foreign aid, all the infrastructure uh, financing is not enough. Uh, yeah. According to the ADB uh, research, there is a big gap between the demand and uh, the supply of the infrastructure uh, uh, infrastructure uh, building in in Asia and uh, even in, in the whole world. So there is a big gap between that. So. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, challenge is the unbalanced uh, uh, aid sector distribution. Yeah. So, uh, the uh, how about how for uh, like Chinese foreign aid? How to balance between the economic inf uh, of their foreign aid between the economic infrastructure and uh, and uh, the uh, social social sectors? So it's also a problem for. For Chinese foreign aid, uh, for those South South cooperation, uh, because uh, these emerging countries, their foreign aid, they call itself a South South cooperation, South South developing cooperation. So it's a, a problem facing to them. On the one hand, so maybe we should learn from the dark countries. Yeah, uh, but uh, we will say uh, this, uh, like China and this. Uh, 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 Russia and uh, Russia, India, we say we are South South pro, uh, cooperation uh, providers. So we are different from the developing countries. So we can't accept all the dark principles and the rules. So we it's better we accept our own system, our own management system, yeah, system um, and the framework. But uh, on the other hand, 
So that means we want a new system, a new framework, different from the dark one. But on the other hand, when we are thinking about how to improve our folding aid, how improve that? So the, all the ideas, all the ideas and the suggestions, uh, we can see, we can find that in dark. In the, like the sector distribution, of course, our comparative advantage is in the infrastructure building. But uh, but uh, dark countries they emphasize more on social sectors. But we think maybe is that we also need to go to that direction to some extent. Uh, uh, I arrived here uh, two days before, so I visit ADB. Yeah, yesterday and before yes, and yes, the day before yesterday. Even ADB is a kind of uh, international uh, international financial institution, uh, but it's also a kind of uh, Asia style uh, development uh, cooperation. Uh, because they said uh, in 1990s, in 1990s, uh, the Western countries they think the poverty reduction and uh, the lack the project uh, the poverty reduction uh, reduction. Uh, uh, project which directly goes to the uh, families, uh, peoples, uh, the local peoples, is more important than this infrastructure, infrastructure um, uh, uh, project. So, so, uh, so uh, ADB they also uh, reform to to some extent to that direction. But uh, after some years, after about ten years, uh, is a pra practice in this field then. Uh, ADB go back, uh, go back, uh, still pay more attention uh, to the infrastructure. Uh, like uh, you, we can see from World Bank, their investment, their loan goes to uh, infrastructure sector just uh, about 30 to 40 percentage, but the ADB is about uh, 85 percentage. This is what uh, what uh, East Asia countries, uh, our development uh, uh, concept and uh, approach to, to push, uh, uh, push the economic development and also the poverty reduction. We may think, uh, we may think uh, uh, the poverty reduction uh, is the result of the economic development, not the poverty reduction itself is, uh, is the target. So, so this is, of course, we will think about what the international community is uh, uh, the trend of the international cooperation, and uh, uh, so should we uh, reform according to that direction? But uh, uh, but maybe to some extent it's okay, but uh, we can't change completely. Uh. Uh, Chinese folding aid was always criticized to uh, to take. Uh, uh, less attention to the environmental and the social effects. So this is what the uh, Chinese family need to uh, uh, think about more. And uh, then um, uh, this is uh, one important issue of Chinese foreign aid, which is lack of uh, lack of uh, assessment and evaluation system. This is what 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 was my purpose to visit uh, ADB these two days because uh, China is uh, uh, before China is also a foreign aid receiver and also the uh, like uh, uh, also the borrower of the, uh, from the World Bank and the ADB and all these international uh, financial institutions as a borrower. Uh, China is quite uh, responsible, and uh, we uh, do what the uh, World Bank ADB uh, ask us to do. We, so uh, we return the return the, the loan uh, on time and uh, strictly according to the to the principles and the rules. But as a lender now, China uh, more and more turned into the uh, our actor uh, our position as a as a lender. But uh, does but China is very strict. In when lending money, yeah, when uh, to uh, think about the debt sustainability of those uh, borrowing countries, and also uh, to evaluate and monitor all the uh, infrastructure and the folding aid project. So this is what the Chinese, Chinese folding aid and also this uh, infrastructure uh, cooperation with other countries need to think about because now the risk uh, uh, risk up uh, to some extent and. Uh, uh, and how how uh, 
uh, if those countries face the face the debt crisis, uh, uh, both both part for the recipient parts uh, for the developing other developing country and China, we all will lose in in that uh, in that deal. So this is uh, so finally is uh, finally is a reform of Chinese foreign aid to better match the Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, for the uh, I discussed that in two. Uh, two perspectives. One is uh, aid policy reform, one is a policy. Uh, uh, so the first is that the development financing system should be to be reformed. Uh, one is to re uh, uh, on the one hand to uh, China try to reshape the e existing multilateral financial systems for development. Uh, China uh, uh, push to establish the new multilateral investment and the financial institution like AIB, NDB, and also uh, China try to pro properly use all kinds of financial modalities, uh, uh, cooperate uh, uh, with uh, dark countries, and also use uh, different sources of development uh, financing uh, domestically. Yeah. And for the for the aid contents, uh, the, the first uh, for the aid contents and the sector reform, uh, uh, China qu try to balance between economic assistance and the social assistance, and uh, at the different stages of better and the road uh, uh, projects, and also try to g uh, need to give full give full pay to important role of knowledge cooperation. China also established the China International Development uh, Knowledge Center yeah, in 2015. This is what uh, China tries to do, to, to introduce uh, Chinese economic development and poverty reduction knowledge to, the, uh, to share that with the other developing countries. Uh, for the, uh, for the uh, aid Actors, uh, try, uh, it's necessary to explore m m more uh, private sectors in in development uh, in development cooperation. So, uh, which mean, uh, pay attention to the role of NGO and uh, uh, in development cooperation, and also build new uh, global development partnership. Uh, Uh, for the organization uh, setup, uh, for the management perspective, the first important issue in Chinese foreign aid is the, for the management organization. China has just established a special foreign aid agency, and uh, uh, further, they need to uh, the, the agency need to c clarify the functions and the responsibilities of the department within the agency, and also coordinate the work uh, within the other. Aid department, like in in the other ministry, like uh, uh, under the, the like the the science and technology ministry, uh, 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 agriculture ministry. Yeah, they need to because uh, those ministries still have the role, have an important role in international uh, in the development cooperation. So uh, the this agency, one important agency uh, uh, role of this agency is to coordinate, uh, coordinate. Yeah, and uh, then finally, uh, yeah, the implementation of the aid uh, policy uh, is also important. Uh, and then finally, the most important is the monitoring and the evaluation system uh, need to be established. And of course, the the data, uh, the data, uh, how to make the Chinese phone aid data transparent and all the information to be transferred is, uh, is a beginning point for, for the monitoring and the evaluation system to be established. Okay, so uh, uh, my time is, is up, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we now have two presentations. The past presentations focus really on the sort of competition happening right now in development financing, uh, as well as some of the lessons moving forward. But now we have to go back to a discussion on the complementary field, which is security, by Dr. Uh, Sadia Nurtav Laptop.
first of all, uh, let me thank the organi organizers for the invitation. As I know, uh, Kazakhstan is the first uh, state of Central Asia, which represents in the work of this symposium. Uh, Kazakhstan as a country promoting peace and security in the region highly appreci appreciates cooperation with ASEAN countries. Uh, the topic of my report is ASEAN Regional Forum on Security and Prospects of its Development in the Context of Kazakhstan's Position on Integration. Uh, as all of us know, uh, the first military political issue, which was the subject of comprehensive discussion in the format of ASEAN Post Ministerial Conference in 1991 uh, was the withdrawal of American military bases from the territory of the Philippines. In 1992, uh, a similar conference dealt with the territorial dispute over the Spartli Archipelago, which claimed by China, Taiwan, and a number of ASEAN member states. This practice eventually led to the establishment in Bangkok in 1994 uh, of a dialogue mechanism on regional security issues as a permanent body. Since 1995, having formalized in the ASEAN Regional Forum on Security in Brunei Darussalam, the participants meet annually to monitor the military political situation in and, and around Southeast Asia and implement uh, in its framework, the three areas of the complex of certain confidence measures, preventive diplomacy, and the development of approaches of, uh, to conflict resolution. Uh, except uh, 27 countries of ASEAN Regional Forum, including the top 10 dialogue partners and a number of other countries of Asian Pacific region, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and Kyrgyzstan have observer status in the forum and in the future express an interest in becoming its members. Uh, while believing that, is, uh, that this advisory body, the European Union, the third most significant after APEC uh, and the ASEAN structure itself will allow them to connect in general to political, economic, and cultural interaction with all the actors in the region. Uh, I will not elaborate on the activities of the IRF in details. Uh, the fact that the IRF continues to be the leading mechanism of the multilateral re regional political dialogue on the whole range of issues related to peace and stability in the Asian Pacific region can be seen by listing the following documents. Uh, IRF development concept, IRF vision until 2020 uh, and action plan for its implementation, register of experts and eminent persons, overview of the IRF process, development of interaction between the first and second tracks of the IRF, uh, and etc. Uh, in the aspect of reviewing the activities of the IRF, it is necessary to note its second track or the so-called unofficial second plan process represented by over 60 institutions affiliated with ASEAN, among them the Shangri-La Dialogue and the Asia-Pacific Security Cooperation Council are particularly no uh, noteworthy. Uh, ASEAN Regional Forum is not an institution, a military political structure. The forum participants do not set the task of creating any formalized security structure in Pacific region, uh, Asia Pacific region, like say the OEC in Europe. Uh, the existing forum allows all members of the forum to set forth their views on the military and political problems uh, of the region in tandem with the economic ones while remaining uh, unrelated is st to strict military and political communities. Uh, this means that the agreements reached during the work of various IRF bodies are not formalized in any legally significant acts and therefore are not binding. In this regard, some uh, experts recognize uh, in the IRF the prerequisites of transformation into an analog of the OC that is organizing primarily political dialogue and cooperation without a clearly expressed power support. 
Uh, the issue under consideration are the agenda of six party security negotiators outside the ASEAN, which in turn also casts the IRF aside. In this con context, an attempt to achieve a synergetic effect from interaction with sub-regional security institutions, uh, for example, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SICA, can be a serious challenge for the IRF which will make this structure more attractive for China and other participants. Russia, as one of the key member states of the forum, shares in this case the vision of China that it is necessary to use the experience of other regional organizations, especially the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in order to increase the productivity of the IRF's work, especially in light of the initiative of the Tashkent Summit, uh, on the formation of a network of partnership between Asian and Pacific forums and organizations. Uh, the next issue that needs to be touched upon in terms of prospects for improving the activities of the ASEAN Regional Forum is to expand the range of its members while taking into account that the forum takes a very uh, deliberate approach to its decision and has declared a temporary moratorium on the admission of new actors. Among the most attractive candidates on this list are, as was already, not already noted, separate states from Central and South Asia. Kazakhstan, uh, since 2000, uh, actively promotes the application for accession to the ASEAN Regional Security Forum. Uh, on this proposal, Kazakhstan found support from many ASEAN states. Uh, during the sixth Asian Security Summit on the Shangri-La Dialogue Forum in Singapore in 2007, um, in which it is in the context of the need to realize greater integration of Central Asian states with the rest of Asia, and including the Southeast uh, or its inclusion in the big Asian family, emphasized that the participation of Central Asian states in the extended Asian community would be very useful. At the same time, uh, before joining the, to the A ASEAN Regional Forum, Kazakhstan needs to develop a holistic and quiet structured vision of participation. In this forum, goals are and tactics is expected results, action plan within the forum, uh, based on the analysis of IRF activities, Kazakhstan needs to act step by step in order to join the IRF. Participation in this um, institution can begin with the status of the ASEAN dialogue partner, which will allow the Republic to participate in the work of the intersessional groups and meetings of the IRF to enlist the support of majority of the member state considering that Central Asia is not yet part of uh, ASEAN's interests politically and legally formally, one can assume that the Republic's entry to the forum whose work is uh, carried out under the leadership of ASEAN can be consistently implemented after the signing of the basic ASEAN plus Central Asia strategy by the analogy of the European Union plus Central Asia strategy for every five years, uh, while reaffirming the readiness to assume the obligations arising from previous decisions and agreed uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, as well as securing the support of all ASEAN member states. In this regard, it should be noted that the ex exper experience of Kazakhstan's interaction with ASEAN structures is already available uh, and it can have a significant impact on the admission of the Republic of Kazakhstan to the ASEAN Regional Forum member states. Here is meaning the Asia Cooperation Dialogue, whose members, along with 10 full-fledged ASEAN member states, are also Russia, Japan, India, China, Sri Lanka, and Kazakhstan. The dialogue initiative put forward by Thailand at the ASEAN Foreign Minister's meeting in February 2002 is now successfully functioning and uh, is intended to be a mechanism for cooperation between Asian regional institutions, not only ASEAN itself. Uh, for example, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN, 
uh, but also Tsark and Council on Cooperation of the States of the Persian Gulf and etc. Uh, Kazakhstan's desire to become a member of the a uh, ASEAN Regional Forum is explained by the fact that on the basis of its activities in the future, a regional security system in the international legal sense capable of being established. That is a new ASEAN. In the mean, uh, meantime, unfortunately, we can state only the fact that according to experts, Kazakhstan still continues to show an interest in strengthening cooperation with ASEAN, in particular within the framework of the ASEAN Regional Forum on Security. Uh, all participants are committed to further expanding the scope of negotiations with access to a wider range of pro problems related to the concept of integrated security. On the other hand, the IRF has not become a multilateral decision-making mechanism in the field of security. The format uh, of the forum allows reducing tensions and has a stabiliz stabilizing effect on political process through rapprochement of positions. Uh, in conclusion, it should be noted that the ASEAN Regional Forum on Security in the context of the need to legalize the foundations and mechanisms of the functioning of the organization cannot remain in the future solely as an advisory body. Together with the subordinate structures and in addition with the non-governmental organizations of the second track, it must become the main body of ASEAN, which develops not only politically binding recommendations, but also binding decisions, and in particular to the un unresolved numerous territorial disputes between member states. In the same aspect, the ASEAN Regional Forum needs to determine the period of validity of the announced moratorium on admission of new member states. In this regard, Kazakhstan's participation in the ASEAN Regional Forum as an observer is still the most achievable and uh, permissible option for organizational inclusion in the integration process taking place with ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you.